word for the sexual misconduct definition so that we can I left I left the last meeting a little bit early um, because of some other commitment so I didn't really know whether you guys got the chance to went through the whole thing um, if it's okay, what I'd like to do is share my screen and then uh, point out the couple of areas where there were some changes. Let me see if I can find the right one. Looks like, there we go. Okay. Um, I know you're seeing the right screen. I am not, let me find it. There it is. Okay, There's, I've got them. I've got all my files open, so it's a bit of a mess here. Okay, so the only real two the real changes were in the definition of consent. Can you see that? I can make it bigger if I need to. Um, oops, that's way too big. Hang on. Rowan, in the just uh, very quickly, the, in the most recent version I'm looking at the. There's redundant. There's a redundant phrase in the very first sentence at the very top of the page. Okay. I don't know if it's an an incident of an incident of it just FYI. An incident of it. means an incident. Oh, great! Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um. So yeah. So the language committee. Um. And the rules, so the rules working group is not affiliated with the Sexual Misconduct Council, but they are adopting definitions that will be used to administer this law. And so I'm hoping that they will come up with the same definitions that you're using in the survey, right? So I showed them the definitions that you've been using. Shannon Rose is the director of the Sexual Assault Task Force, and she wanted to see a little bit more about consent. The, the consent definition we had I thought was great. It was consent means freely given permission to participate in sexual contact when the option to say no is present and viable. Um, and I see there's a duplicate there too. I got, okay, got it. Taking that out. All right. Um, and she, she wanted a little bit more expansion there, which I think was helpful. So con consent cannot be given by a person who is asleep, unconscious, incapacitated by any means, including by intoxicants, or otherwise unable to make informed decisions. And that last clause, under otherwise unable to make informed decisions, we felt that that sort of caught people who may not have the mental capacity to um, make that choice because there's that, that, you know, we're very sensitive about autonomy, right? And there was also concern about people who are underage, um, but this isn't a legal definition. So we, we sort of wanted to avoid, you know, over 18 unless they are within three years, you know, that it's that kind of thing. So that's why that clause was. And Kelly, I'm sorry, I'm seeing your hand. No, no. Um, yeah. I just want to add that also it's important. Well, whether it's important to put in the definition or not, I think we all understand that it's also important that consent, even when given, can be revoked immediately, right? Like that that it's not consent given it does not mean permanent consent. <laughs> does that make sense? I mean, does that mm -hmm. am I am I making sense that yes. Um, and does that something that needs to be in the definition or is it sufficient to just make clear what we mean by consent as a so i guess what well, all i'm proposing is as long as it doesn't as long as we don't mind it becoming slightly more complicated i think it's worth noting that consent can also be revoked uh you, you know immediately and permanently That that's probably sufficient right there. I think <laughs> that covers everything I was thinking. That is, is there any other discussion on that? Okay, all right, moving on then. The other thing that got changed, um, so here we have our definitions of gender-based violence and harassment or violence based on sexual orientation, because those are listed as types of sexual misconduct in the, the statute's definition of sexual misconduct. Um, so we felt it was important to pull those out. So we've got the gender-based violence one, and I'm sorry, I don't remember if you all have seen that before or if this is the first time. Okay. We were working then, on that last last meeting. That looks familiar thank to me. You. 
Okay. And Kelly, your inner English teacher is going to hate this next piece, the <laughs> harassment yeah, I, or violence. <laughs> that yeah. um, that sentence has six ors in it, but it, we couldn't think of another way to write it. Yeah, and I looked at it. Uh, I looked at it a little bit too, and decided that anybody who's reading purposefully would understand it. And I mean, it just it makes it complicated in a different way if you start adding periods and breaking it up into multiple sentences and stuff like that. Okay, so in its awkward present state, is that okay with folks? Does anyone want to see any changes? Okay, I think we're done. I think we have the definitions. Yay. Okay, this is awesome. Okay, so I will um, share these back. And, and like I said, these have been reviewed by the language committee. They've been reviewed and, and I will share these back to the um, rules working group and just let them know these are the definitions, period. These are what we're working with here. Okay, great. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. Um, for the, the next section is, is demographics, the next item on the agenda. Um, after the, was anyone else in that, um, the OHA uh, data equity summit this week? Rudy, and you were, right? Yes, I was in the data equity summit. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. I have to catch up on the second half of the day, but definitely the full first day. Yeah, I thought it was there was there was some really good stuff in there. If the recordings become available, I'll share them with anyone who might be interested. Um, I thought that the the folks, um, the folks who uh, the native folks who talked um, did an excellent job of of talking about the, the ways to include um, think about uh, including the tribes um, and ways of thinking about data sovereignty. It was excellent, just kind of as an aside, and then. Kieran um, Chase is actually a former Reed student, and they were they were an advocate, and um, they're also a graduate student, and they're working at OHA. There's, um, they're one of those people who is just always doing everything. I wonder if we want to wait and to talk more about the demographics until I've had a chance to meet with them, um, because that I, and I don't know if anyone had a, a chance to look at the real D Soji document that I had. Okay. I think it's that's way more complicated than we need, right, for our purposes. But I think that there's some stuff in there that we might be able to use. I kind of like the way they've got it, um, and I'm I think I'm I'm not sure if I have that open. I could probably open that if folks want to see it. But um, they had, for example, for uh, Pacific Islander, they had. Uh, the category Pacific Islander, and then they had in the box underneath different things that people could select. So they could select Micronesian, they could select Native Hawaiian or whatever. And that's a way of, the, the problem with getting that granular is that we have to kind of erase people's identity by grouping them together if the cell size is small, because we're trying to protect their anonymity, right? So if there's one person who's got the identity of Micronesian on your campus and they respond, then. Um, but we also want to offer folks enough opportunities to find themselves. And I liked the way that they had it um, uh, kind of formatted. So my suggestion is that I talk to Kieran, um, explain to them what we're working on. They're familiar with sexual misconduct surveys. They've seen the one at Reed before and um, see if they have any recommendations or suggestions for us. And then um, I can I can bring those back. And, and I'm hoping they might, like I said, I hope they might be willing to do a training for us because I think that could be really useful. That sounds I, like... I, what? Yeah, well, you feel free. Yeah, I just want to throw quickly throw two or two things there, because um, I I did find some folks at Reed um, who like identify as uh, gender queer or just someone who's not cisgender or not 
heterosexual, and I showed them the very original war document that we um, put together, and I showed them the section about gender identity. They are just I I got I did got a chance to read the the um the the real D um demographic question that Rowan uploaded. I do agree that they have a like especially with regard to gender identity part, I do think they have a better and more inclusive section there. Um, um, for the original word document that we have, there are mainly two problems. The first thing is that cross dress is not a gender identity. It's a kind of it's a kind of thing people do. It's not a thing that people identify with a lot. Um, another thing is that if we decide to use women and men, we also should use that for transgender woman, transgender men instead of transgender female or transgender male. And also, I think in our original one, we didn't really have the option of gender queer and gender fluid, but both options are 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 like things. Um, at least I read in like um, I think I think it's like a, already a very well identified kind of gender identity in LGBTQ plus community, and that's it. And what I wanted to add to that, I heard back from our staff from our career resource centers who recommended the resource. And Rowan, I thought I met and sent this to you, but I might not have, because I was trying to decide how to put it on one of our documents. <clears throat> Excuse me, but it's specifically from the Consortium of Higher Ed. And they have a recommendations for asking gender on campus form surveys and campus records, and they give several examples. I'm gonna put it in the chat for folks and like which page to find it on. I did find it really helpful, particularly because it gave not only recommendations, they gave samples. And then they also, um, they were also relatively brief and inclusive, right? Cause I wanna honor, we in our, when we are working with students who are in confidential advocacy, we give lots of options for folks and it's an extremely long list, right? So I, I, I wanna honor like inclusivity while also when it gets overwhelming. And I thought that that's something that they balanced well. So I'm just going to throw that in the chat for everyone as well. Thank you, Caroline. And I'm sorry, I don't remember seeing it. You may well have sent it to me. So It's possible I started or I dreamt it. That's like <laughs> I'm a little running, extra running like right now. So I, but I wanted yeah. to make sure. And I also had it earmarked on my calendar for these meetings to uplift it. Because like I said, I wasn't sure what to put on the draft that we had because I wanted more, I was hoping for more of a let's look at it in discussion than a, I didn't have a specific recommendation, but they had good lists. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I've sent a lot of psychic emails myself. But like, <laughs> so, um, and Bill, thank you so much for getting that feedback from folks. I really appreciate it. I think um, that feedback kind of speaks to the fluidity and the diversity of identities, because I know a lot of older folks who identify their gender as cross-dresser, and that actually came from a transgender um, data or, or, or the of recommendations from a transgender organization. Um, so yeah, it's it's complicated and lovely and and yeah. So it's hard when you're like, really, do we need any boxes at all? But if we're gonna have boxes, we need to have lots. So yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. So let's take a look at that. Um, I'll also bring that to um, when I, I talk with Kieran and and we can go on. So we're okay on kind of tabling the the demographics. Great. And then I just want to introduce the next section by saying that um, I went ahead, I know how busy people are and I know that we're getting to the end of the semester and it's going to get really crunchy and crazy um, on an academic basis as well as on a personal basis. And so I went ahead and drafted the started drafting A through D and I just to kind of give us something to work with. Um, but I am I you know, if somebody else wants to take a pass through those or um, you know, it's like, no, I reject this. We need to start over again. I'm totally fine with that. Um, and I don't know. So do we want to talk about that one right now? Okay. Do you want me to go ahead and share screen? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Okay. 
go. It's a little bit bigger. Thanks. Okay. All right. So um, I just wanted, I just kind of put a placeholder in there that, that, you know, before each section, we will be asking, you know, we'll have information for folks saying, you know, the next section asks you about these things. Um, we understand this may these questions may be difficult for some people. Please click here. You know, you can you can you can not answer any questions you don't want to. Please click here if you want to skip the section. Okay. Um, so just with that, and then um, the types of sexual misconduct we might ask about, and and we're supposed to ask about everything that's on the 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 with the black bullets here. So those we have to ask about. Um, but we can also ask about, I don't know, is it helpful to ask about penetrative versus non-penetrative sexual assault? Can we talk about that for a minute? I have some feelings about it, but I'm wondering what you all think. I, anybody else want to jump in? I feel I fear I'm going to talk a lot today because we're doing survey design and I get really wonky about this. But am I cutting anybody off who'd like to? You sure? OK, um, so I, I think one of the. Core principles of survey design is don't ever ask for information you're not going to use. And so I think the way to frame this question, Rowan, is. Do we think that that distinction? will be analytically important or useful somewhere after it's been collected. And then, of course, we have to ask, then there's the language, which is, is it is it appropriate to ask somebody that question? Does it induce trauma? Does it does it sort of, you know, bring back histories, things like that? But but from a design point of view. If we don't think it would be used or meaningful, that is, if if people simply. Treat a sexual violence incident as the important category, regardless of what kind of sexual violence incident it was after that, then I don't think you ask about it. Um, that's not an answer to the do we or don't we, but I think it is, it's kind of the first, to me, it's the first level question. If we think that distinction would be analytically meaningful, then we go and have, have the discussion about how to frame it, things like that, or how to phrase it rather, what words to use. And I'm, I don't know what I think on, on the answer to my own question at this point. Um, although my instinct is to be cautious and therefore I think my starting point would be talk me into using that kind of language, convince me that it's important, right? Like let's decide that it's important, not, not going at it the other way, which is let's not try to decide that it's not important. Let's try to decide that it is. Um, I do think Kelly mentioned something that I want to ask you, Rowan. Um, with regard to the type of sexual misconduct, <laughs> like how detailed we really need in order to have a informed enough uh, summary or report or conclusion about it. Because um, if we want to like see whether like we should distinguish non-penetrative sexual assault and penetrative sexual assault, then according to Kelly, do we really like with regard to um, the purpose of having a clearer and and inform like informative enough like report of this? Like, it, does it make sense for us to distinguish these two, or it, it's like just they are all just kind of sexual assault? So, like, I guess my question is how detailed we we need to know about with the type of sexual misconduct. Yeah. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave your question open because I think that's that's yes, part of the discussion. I'm really interested in hearing what other folks, um, Caroline and Adea, uh, what you might think about that. Are we just? Are we asking the uh, students themselves? Are we going to ask them in detail about this and give them the definitions? Uh, well, we probably won't give them the definition. We would just ask them, has someone done this to you? Um, mm -hmm. I think it's standard for all the surveys to have that there. Um, I know a lot of them do. 
yeah. actually, sorry, go ahead. they go into more detail. They actually go into more detail. Instead of mm -hmm. penetrate one's body, they break it up into parts and things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is actually kind of tame compared to the other things I've seen. Well, I, I mean, to me, though, uh, Adea, the question is, will do we think that there will be analytically meaningful analysis to be done if we draw the distinction, right? Between these two um, non-penetrative yeah, and exactly. penetrative? Right. And certainly um, in this, to the people at this conversation, we don't have any difficulty sort of acknowledging that those are meaningful distinctions. The question is, is will institutions that deploy and collect here. And of course, we're not going to know. We're just trying to decide whether if we leave it well, out, if we just sort of stop at sexual violence and leave that distinction out, will they say, gee, we really need to know this survey stops one question short of what we needed. Or if we ask it, do they say, wow, we didn't need to put people that far into the thought process because we just don't envision any way to actually use that or that we're not going to use it or something? I don't that's know what good, the right answer is. I wish I did. That's a good point. According to, like you said, survey development is what we're going to do with the violence, sexual violence. I mean, uh, what we will do with the extra data and uh, distinguishing between the two. Sexual violence is sexual violence, whether it's non penetrative or penetrative. Uh, I would think we would probably uh, address it the same way um, if I was a resource officer or whatever. So, um, well, yeah, I don't know. Um, I would err on the side of less information and just just define what sexual violence is, that it include, can include non-penetrative and penetrative and then just allow them to answer the both, you know, instead of saying, is it this or is it that? So I wanna, so something I'm sitting with with this conversation, I'll note that I am not sold either way or the other. The argument mm -hmm. for including it though, is that right now at my at PCC, I'm engaging with certain groups of students right now that are um, really downplaying the impacts of violence. And one of the benefits of being, it feels like, and once again, I'm not sold either way, but this is what I'm kind of sitting with, with the, like, the challenge around this, or one of the benefits or what have you, is that if a college can, can differentiate, we have a, I think that we have a lot of community members who, especially right now, <laughs> with the climate we're in, um, that would downplay the harm of fondling. I think that we have very uh, people in positions of power who have openly talked about fondling women. And it's we it feels a little bit like we're going back to the rhetoric of boys will be boys, and therefore it's not really harmful. So I think that there's a value in differentiating it because we can say this percentage of our students have indicated they have experienced a completed rape. I will note, I don't love the word penetration, so I would just urge us to consider that word. But I do think there's a value to indicate the, the truth behind the level of violence people are experiencing. Because I'm worried that if we lump it all together, people will be like, oh, but we don't know how many of these are like, quote unquote, serious or not. And no, please know that I'm not saying that, but I'm worried that that will be the, what, the narrative. Will people will be like, yeah, but like, who? is it really that big a deal if someone's butt was grabbed? And that's my fear about us putting them together because we will be missing a huge portion of people when all of these are harmful, all of these acts are harmful. But I think people will be like, hey, yeah, it was probably more groping and less completed rape. And we know that's not necessarily the case of what's happening on our campuses. So I'll just sit, that's what I'm sitting with when I'm thinking about the pros or cons of adding it. Yeah. And that that's my concern too. I mean, I have, I think if we break it out, then we are catering to that narrative of real rape versus just being groped, right? And I think that that, um, I think that is harmful. I think that there will always be people who um, will, will downplay that. Um, 
it seems to be something to put on your resume. No, I'm sorry. And it, but it's, I, so that's one reason I think we shouldn't break it out because I don't want us, I think we need to be able to say that, yeah, this is, you know, being groped by someone, having your, you know, having your genitals groped by someone is really traumatic and it is a form of sexual violence and penetrative sexual assault you may need other resources you may have other healing issues it might you know you might have that experience differently but the sense of shock the sense of betrayal uh, the sense of not wanting to be in the same room with the person are not going to be that different right so yeah is there any Can we use? I'm thinking: is there is there any sort of legal distinction that that would help us make a decision here? Like, I, I mean, I'm almost a little worried about how ignorant I am about how, how ignorant ignorant I may sound here. But while you may get in trouble at school and high school if you grab somebody's behind, for Carolyn's example you probably can't be accused and adjudicated in a court of law for that. Whereas, or can you, that's like, that's where my ignorance is at, like, or can you, um, versus, and to me, these would be arguments to, to draw the distinction. Like if the law draws a distinction, maybe we should too, uh, it, because then we can speak about it more meaningfully. But then there's the same risk that you pose, Carolyn, which is that that also gives people hard evidence, Rowan, to your point, gives people hard evidence to argue that there are two classifications and maybe there's lots more of one than the other and that therefore it's not as serious as, as I don't, I don't know. I, I, I have to confess that just through this discussion though, I'm leading towards thinking we should draw the distinction um, precisely because as Carolyn points out, people, if we don't draw the distinction, people have a much easier plausible inference that it's all probably just the less important kind and but if you but if you have a measure of of all types, even if one of those categories is small, you can still say maybe it's not the most common, but there it is, evidence that it happened, and that may be the important thing to draw from this. So I, I just put our definition of sexual violence, the one we just approved, in there. Um, I I totally get what you're both saying. Um, I, I worry about feeding into the. You know, I've, I've, I personally have a, a lot of resistance to that. Um, one concern that I have is that men's sexual assault of men by women is not considered as serious as sexual assault of women by men. Um, the CDC was the first uh, organized in the National Intimate Intimate Partner Sexual Violence Survey, I can't remember the actual names. Um, they were the first ones to ask men if, you know, people with penises, has anyone ever used your body um, for their sexual gratification, right? Rather than looking at sex, because I think that's one of the things too, is that that penetration is seen as, as the actual harm, right? Well, if you weren't penetrated, it wasn't really harmful. If your, you know, if your anus or your vagina was not really penetrated, it was not penetrated, then it wasn't that bad. Um, and I think that's a myth that I, I do worry um, about promulgating. The other question that I would ask us is, is it worth, is it worth making the definition? Is it because every time we're asking a question of a survivor, we are running a risk of bringing something up or re-traumatizing them. You know, survivors are really, really strong, right? But but these questions are harmful in a way. And is it worth the harm to survivors to get that information? Or is it worth the possible harm to survivors to get that detail of information? I I agree with Rowan's concern about like asking too specifically would be more triggering and um, put more risk of letting them being re traumatized by answering the survey. And my I do have a preference of not distinguish this two, not only just for 
making making it a little bit less specific and making the whole survey slightly shorter to make the whole experience of feeling it out feel like a less burden but also for like I, I, according to my observation of uh, queer couples around me, many of them no longer do penetration sex. It's, and especially between people that just don't have penises. It's not the, the like, pe whether it's penetration or not, it's no longer something that would really distinguish how sexual the behaviors was, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm thinking about from that perspective, um, when like when there are already a lot of couples no longer doing penetrative sex but still have like still being sexually active i think distinguish these two would 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 be i don't want to say not inclusive but is the sense is that we do want to include those kind of people who don't have penetrative sex but do have sex and to include their experience into it if that makes sense Thank you, Kevin. All right, I am I am supportive of both ways. I think I, I see the value in both of them. I can see the potential harm as well. So I, I will note that I'm kind of like, uh. <laughs> um, I think that for me, if we choose not to differentiate, I feel like there is, because um, I hear the concern of both with causing harm to survivors and in perpetuating myths around the harm of different types of sexual violence, and I 100% agree. I think that it feels important to me that, that, and maybe this isn't the right platform for it, I wanna honor that, that we there is like, what's the educational piece? Is there something that we include in the narrative when we send this out? Is there something that we can name the reason why we didn't so that we can try to help shift culture around this? Because I, I don't want to, um, I want us to be careful to not do it because we don't want to perpetuate these myths while also then um, not thinking about shifting culture to understand the overall harm that this, these issues cause on, on the whole and why the details don't actually matter. That what matters is, is someone touched another person's body without their consent with the goal of causing harm, essentially, right? Like I want to, I, I know that that's a, when we think about prevention, that, that not, that's not technically what everyone's goal is. And... <laughs> <laughs> right. So I just think that I would love to see if we choose not to, that we really think about what we're adding information wise. So to help people both find themselves in the answer um, and also to educate institutions as they're putting this information out and maybe even how they can then report it out in a meaningful way. So they're acknowledging it as well. Like we chose not to differentiate this for the following reason. We believe this is harmful to all of our students like that. I really like that, Caroline. I think that that it, that framing piece is really important, and maybe that's something in the implementation guidelines that we can talk about, you know, if we choose not to or if we choose to, why we did. The other concern that I have by saying there are some kinds of sexual violence that are more serious than others is thinking about prevention if there are young people out there who are like, well, I didn't actually penetrate their body, so it wasn't really rape, rape. I didn't actually rape them, right? So it's okay as long as I didn't actually do that. It, what I did was, you know, probably not okay, but it wasn't that bad. Um, and I think that's that's another message that we we risk sending. One of the, I, I might be jumping in too fast. <laughs> I think about how um, if we put everything together under one heading, I recognize how many survivors, folks that based on what they're describing to me, 
I would define as sexual violence, though they themselves don't define it as sexual violence. What level of details do we want to provide to people? So A, we're not causing harm, but we are helping them see themselves in the experience enough to uplift their voice. Right. So making sure that that behavioral, did any of these kinds of things happen to you, that that behavioral description is inclusive enough that people yeah. will see themselves. Yeah. And I know, I know that's, yeah, we've all talked to survivors, I'm sure, who've been like, well, it wasn't really rape, rape, because I knew him, I'd had sex with them before. And yeah, and a lot of, a lot of ways that we downplay that for our own survival and safety, right? Well, we, we hear from our students a lot that they are really uncomfortable with the term sexual assault, because mm -hmm. to them that means rape and they're like no no but it wasn't right so that's the same idea like yeah so yeah i just want to and going back to what we've all said we don't want to cause harm by giving such level right. of detail that it's triggering people and, and such so i know we're all in a sticky situation with this yeah can i ask a question hmm? are we going to use the term sexual violence i thought we were going to just describe the description of what happened to you have you ever been fondled blah 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 or whatever and uh, um yeah i was yeah i don't know <sighs> my so suggestion we, yeah my suggestion would be that we not that we say has anyone ever had contact yeah, with yeah. yeah with a, a you know contact with you in a sexual manner or contact with your intimate areas without your consent yeah and just leave it at that you know, and by and we can say by contact, we mean, you know, any kind of touch that you did not want with a body part or, you know, or object. Yeah. And it could be penetrative or non penetrative or yeah. something like that and make it general. And mm -hmm. I think and then later, if you want to say, do you uh, do you consider this to be sexual assault? And that goes into the educational, I mean, sexual balance, and that can go into the educational piece on whether they under, understand sexual violence and whether their school talked about it or anything like that, but something general like yeah. that. That my my experience today is that is that they will understand that like the folks that Caroline's talking about, the folks that I'm talking oh. about. If we <laughs> said somebody had somebody, you know, did this thing to this person without their consent, they would say, "Oh, that's rape. That's sexual assault." Okay. But they might not say, but if but they if they're describing their own experience, somebody did this to me without my permission, they would say, but it wasn't really rape rape. Yeah. Um, so they're they're really good at identifying sexual assault, but but when it's your own personal experience, it becomes mm -hmm. a lot harder to put that label on it sometimes, I think. Okay, then just asking them general experiences of what they experience and don't put that label there. And say yeah. this, is, and maybe the school just know the definition of it or something. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think that the school can say, you know, we can tell the school in the implementation directions. We can tell the school, this is what you know. We are we're using these questions to ask about sexual violence. The things that these questions uh, meet the definition of sexual violence that we are using for this survey. And, and we're going to, before we ask those questions, I know you were talking about trauma, but maybe having a little, we're gonna have a blurb before that to try to mitigate that and, you know, and mm -hmm. tell them why we're asking and whatever to make mm -hmm. them feel comfortable and, and ask and say, if you can opt out, if you don't choose to and prefer, yeah. but however we wanna say that to mitigate the trauma. Yeah. Um, the resource I just put in the, the the book I just put in the chat is um, that Lynn Phillips looked at women who said, "Yes, I was hit by someone. You know, I was hit by my partner. I was sexually assaulted by this, or you know, this person had sex with me without my consent. But it wasn't domestic violence, and it wasn't rape, rape. And so she was really interested in that disconnect. And so that's what she's exploring in that book. A really, really good, highly recommend. Anyhow, okay." Okay, so we can. So where are we? Where are we at with this? Do Kelly, where are you? Can I ruined it. Oh, sorry. Who are you asking? I think she asked you. Oh, I. I'm now wondering if maybe we shouldn't 
put on our agenda resolution of this question that has just come up. The, the, I think, Adea, you, the way that you framed it kind of raised the new question here, which is, are we, are we going to ask based on the definitions or are we actually going to ask based on sort of a series of sort of escalating terminologies? At least, Rowan, that's generally. I don't. I don't mean this in any um, in any critical or slanderous way. But I mean, like, or are we going to just sort of do a series of escalating questions to sort of see where people stop saying yes, if you will? And if, if, but I, because I think this is a really important. I think we need to decide how, what our what what our philosophical approach is going to be to help us answer some of these other questions, maybe. And and if I'm sort of resetting us, please don't let me do that. That's not my intention. Um, I just, well, I think my instinct is to look at those definitions and think a survey would work really well if, if there's a if there's the definition and then the question and then the definition and the question. But I also heard what you just said, Rowan, which is the fear that people will read the definition in detail and still say, I know people who that happened to, it has not happened to me, even though it's the same experience. So I get that. And I'm just not sure. I'm thinking this may just be for me that it would be helpful for me to sort of figure out how we're going to write any of these if I knew which of those two general approaches we might feel we're going to commit ourselves to. Is that making sense, that question? Yeah, I think I would avoid using the terms sexual assault, sexual violence, rape, domestic violence. I would avoid using all of those. I would even avoid using sexual harassment. Okay. I think in the in the survey, I think in the implementation materials, in the materials that we send out that explain what the survey is going to be about. So some of the promotional materials, okay. we might we might talk about this is what we mean by sexual misconduct. Those definitions should be available, but I think we should avoid using those labels because they're just so strong and they're so problematic. Okay, so then I think maybe then one of the things I need to remember as I think about this is that those definitions aren't aren't there necessarily to be seen by the people who will complete the survey. They're there to be seen by the people who will implement and interpret the survey, but that the survey itself is is meant I mean, and this makes sense that it would then be sort of standalone, that the definition would only be in there if we decided to put it in there. Yeah. Kind of an approach. All right. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. Okay. okay. I'm getting, and I'm I, getting a, oh, go, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I was just going to say, I was gonna, now going to answer your question. Where am I on this? Um, I feel deferential to people who work a little more sort of closely in this on a daily basis. Um, so I, I I am not certain yet. I see the real value in in not drawing that distinction and just asking, you know, has this general experience happened to you? But I also I, I I'm still it looks like Carolyn has disappeared. Um, but I, I'm also still really still really concerned about the the social scenario that Carolyn described, which is if we don't ask it, if we can't sort of an anticipate if we can't anticipate an answer that what fraction it is that say, well, it was only that kind, but there's this many of this kind. And I, I'm sorry, I'm still stuck in the middle on this. And Rowan, I hear what you're saying about it too. I find your argument, your 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 position persuasive as well. <laughs> Just so so I'm still in the middle. Um I could imagine this to me feels like many surveys, which is when you get to a question like this, you just have to figure out which one you're going to commit to and go with it. And then, you know, if you, if you if you do it again, you may change it based on what you learned the first time or the second time or the third time. So um, I'm not sure yet. I don't I don't clearly fall one way or the other. I, I feel persuaded by both sides. I'll just note if it's I will say that at this point, after the conversation, I feel really comfortable um, not separating them out and having uh, the lift and not not separating penetrative versus non-penetrative as long as we do think about that educational that narrative piece of that that culture shift piece in the um about why we chose to do it that way and i think that that is ultimately i really appreciate the conversation of descriptions of the behavior like rowan a few minutes ago you kind of named a way to frame that question or and keeping it pretty simple that i thought was really strong because a lot of people can see themselves through life experiences. So I thought that that was a great example. The follow-up I have though, 
and I apologize because I know we have this sheet mm-hmm. and I, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to figure out because of the, the way it's going to be with you answer one and then it will take you somewhere else potentially. Is there going to be, I want to recognize that some people are groped and it doesn't bother them, right? Mm-hmm. It's it, there because we culturally, it's so normalized. And I, are we going to ask that question of, has this, have you been uh, non-consensually touched with the expanded version of that? And then did this make you feel unsafe or something else? And the reason I ask that is just, once again, culturally, there's a lot of people who it's touched at a bar and it, because it's so culturally normative, it doesn't bother them. And I, I'm, I, um, I guess I'm sitting with that reality and what we're reporting on so that we are culturally, we are identifying culturally where we're at right now versus maybe where we want to be. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there is definitely that perception among a lot of folks too, right. Of, um, well, you know, yeah, it happened to me, but I'm not a victim and it didn't really have an impact on me. We're going to be asking the questions, um, M N N O P (laughs) are the questions where we ask effect, right? What effects did it have on you? So not necessarily did it, what were your feelings about it, but did you drop a class because of it? You know, did you have an exacerbation of any mental health symptoms because of it? And so I think we'll kind of pick that up there. Um, Adea, I know you're really interested in knowing if they labeled it that, what sexual assault or not. Um, I'd like to come back to that, but because I'd like to know how you would use that in analysis. Um, But uh, Kelly, I see your hand. Well, I just wanted to, I mean, in response to, to what Caroline just said, I, I, I think, Rowan, your suggested strategy makes is, is the one that we should be sort of planning to adopt in, in this way. And by that, I mean making it purely descriptive, not interpretive, right? That way, somebody who has been, you know, involuntarily touched at a bar but who's not bothered by that still has to sit there with the reality of the question, which is, has anybody ever, you know, put their hand on you in an uninvited way? And so hopefully a thoughtful person will sit there and think, well, that includes the person who walked up next to me in the bar to order themselves a drink and then got a little friendly by putting their hand on my shoulder. Whether that meant something or not, is not the point. The question is, did it happen or not? So I, 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 I think I like that strategy. And Rowan, I don't let me put words in your mouth, but I think that's what you're arguing for here, right? Is, is to take is to take the interpretation out of out of the respondent's hand, at least initially, so that we can figure out whether or not just these simple behavioral activities occur. And then later we can ask whether or not there was any understanding of an intent or an outcome or something like that that would that would associate with that. So I think that makes and I hope I'm not contradicting any of my earlier arguments, but I mean, this is this is kind of how things evolve, right? I think that makes sense to me because it will challenge people to think about the actual interaction separate from its meaning. That it will be inevitable that people will still attach meaning to it, but that they will at least be if if we word them that way, they will at least be challenged to think about it as simply an action first and then an action with meaning second, and both of which are important, obviously, for what we're doing, but. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm sort of running yeah. in circles again. Yeah, yeah that's. Think, oh, go ahead, Adia, go ahead. Yeah, that's what um, I've done research on discrimination. And uh, that's what Dr. Williams kind of does because people have their own definition of discrimination and you really just want to say, or they may not know they're being discriminated against because they don't have all the definitions. So you just ask, have you experienced A, B, C, D? And you just asked about their experiences. And then you could ask them how they classify it later, or you could not ask them. It depends on if you want to know uh, their definition or, and ask why. It depends on how deep you want to go. Uh, for us, I was thinking of later on asking how they classify or and then what they attributed to, whether it's because they're a woman, blah, 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 whatever. But I just, um, I was just thinking of asking them that because then we could say, tell the schools later that, hey, you have a problem with uh, your students not being able to identify what sexual violence is 
or something like that. It could be informative to the school if no one uh, classifies that, because then you could say, hey, you're saying that your students are saying you've given a course on this, but no one could identify it. I, I see what you're saying, Adea. I think but, that, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I think that what I, I I think what I was trying to say was that they can probably identify that if it happened to someone else it was sexual assault, but they uh -huh. may not label the same behavior happening to them as sexual assault. And that's so, a coping strategy that a lot of survivors use. Yeah. Because they blame themselves and put yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they don't want to be a victim. I mean, if you know, we have a we have a, we assign an identity and a role to the victim, yeah. and you know, who wants to be a victim of sexual assault for the rest of their life, right? I'd rather just think okay. about it. it was yeah. just a bad experience, and it was sex that I didn't want. Yeah, yeah. Well, then maybe not having them attribute it to it. Then okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there there may be a valuable to it. Um, I I'm wondering. I'd like to go back to share screen for a minute because I'm about to say exactly the opposite. I'm about to give you exactly the opposite argument when it comes to domestic violence stuff. And I want to just just want to name that before we get there. Um, so going back up here. So with sexual violence, I don't see that I personally don't see the value in that. There could be value in separating that out with domestic violence, though. I feel like it's really important to ask more specific questions because there are so many different types of domestic violence. And I wanted to point out that I personally am interested in asking about strangulation and head injury or concussion, because there is some, um, in, there's some research that's starting to be done on the number of survivors of uh, domestic violence as well as sexual assault who experience strangulation, we know that that's, you know, that's high, that's highly associated with lethality in domestic violence situations. Um, but strangulation, head injury, and concussion also are have symptoms that a lot of survivors don't necessarily recognize. I, I'm Caroline, you and, and Bell, you may have had this experience of talking to survivors who will say, you know, yeah, I banged my head during the incident. And I'm having trouble with short-term memory and I keep falling asleep, right? Like there's, there's, there will be symptoms of traumatic brain injury um, that they're, uh, they are attributing to the actual, to the, the sexual violence or the physical violence, but they're not necessarily associating, oh, I had a head injury. So I, I think, so I wanted to, I thought it might be interesting to pull that out because head injury, concussion symptoms have all of these cognitive impacts, not necessarily, not necessarily useful for this, but I'm just putting, that's why I bulleted those out. But I think with domestic violence, we do want to ask about, has, we want to give examples. Has anyone ever um, tried to keep you from doing something that you wanted to do or keep you from hanging out with people that you wanted to hang out with? Or have they tried to keep you from going to class or going to work? Or have they called you names? I think those kinds of behaviors we do need to kind of separate out um, and ask more behaviorally or give more examples for. So, And the reason for that is because a lot of people, if you just ask, has your partner ever harmed you? They might say no. You know, because he hasn't actually punched me, you know, he has a, he, he put his fist through the wall, but he didn't hit me, right? So that's why I think we should get a little bit more granular with that one. Um, I would just like to add, I'd love to see that we give examples of reproductive coercion as well, or reproductive abuse. Um, yeah. In this, we know that's going to impact college students mm -hmm. more and more right now. Rowan, I do have a quick question about the uh, specific kinds of physical abuse because you listed strangulation and head injury slash concussion, uh, concussions. I was wondering about if we already asked asked like how specific the physical abuse consequence was, what the kind was. Should we also like ask more? Because I do understand the importance like of traumatic brain injury caused by it because it influence 
um, your brain and your cognitive ability. But you know, if your 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 bone is broken, let's say like if your ankle get injured, where your like leg legs bone get broken, it it, it influences your mobility in a severe way. It influences whether you can go to work, whether you can move around by yourself things like that and i think mm -hmm. it's hard to argue whether it's less harmful than cognitive negative cogn mm -hmm. cognitive impact caused by the violence and so i was i was wondering about what what is the standard here for us to include a more specific type of physical abuse for domestic violence yeah and what's the value of it too right like like you said i think the impact is more important so um, and I'm fine leaving strangulation and head injury out. I just think that I, I just hope advocates are looking for those more and I would like there to be more awareness that those are, are often present. One thing that comes to mind for both the sexual violence question and the domestic violence is we want schools to be able to take this information, understand prevalence and use that for tr when they're thinking about awareness building and prevention, right? So it makes me think of how we ask these questions and it's you know we can say things about there's different ways to do it but really it's about if uh well any school is getting a lot of reports at strangulation and we know that there's a lot of headlines right now around young people in, and use the utilizing strangulation during sex and a lot of schools are interested in those conversations there's opportunity for prevention there's opportunity for awareness building so there's we we can pull out the the opportunities there while once again being really thoughtful of of the way we word things. So, um, I think I think I I would like to move on if it's okay with you. I'd like to kind of move on a little bit and just let you know that. These are some of the examples that I had for um, how we might break out a question about, for example, sexual harassment um, or gender harassment, how we might break those questions out. But I want to recognize how many questions this is going to, you know, that's the other thing, right? Like, how many questions are we going to ask about this stuff? Um, we can end up with uh, way too many. So, I, I want us to think about that. Um, and then I, I said, you know, when we do start to ask about a particular type of misconduct, one of the things we need to think about is the time frame that we're interested in. Do we ask about within the last 12 months? Do we ask about since you started at this school, like what time period do we want to use? Have, have Has anyone got feelings about that or thought about that? Um, uh, Kelly and Adea, I'm sure you have. <laughs> Well, I, I just that I, I would say that there's no right or wrong answer to it, but the, that the more the more we do something like, uh, hold on a second, my dog's chewing on something that he didn't have a moment ago, and I don't think it's something he should be. <laughs> I'll be I'll be right. No worries. Uh, Isaiah, what about you? What 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 time frame did you use at UP when you wrote that survey? Hold on. Um, it was, we did it in a year. We did it in a year, but um, it wasn't demo that much democratic. Uh, I kind of did some research, did the pallet test. Um, we did have a committee uh, that voted on things, but we kind of, I don't know. It was pretty fast because um, you had, it was kind of, I did your job meaning I was doing all the research and writing up the questions and pretty much everybody, uh, we tested it out. The ones that didn't test well, we revised it. But um, yeah, it, it took a year. Okay. And Kelly, what um, time frame? Yeah. Oh, sorry. What were you, what was your question? No, Ron? I was just, yeah, I was going to ask you what time frame you guys used. Oh, uh, the, the surveys we've done are, are all, uh, campus climate so they are within the academic life of whoever's here right now so okay. but one of the what where i was going to with with the thought i started there was you want you know the I, i've mentioned before that taking a survey is a psychological exercise for people they have to go through a series of cognitive steps in order to get from the 
understanding it to deciding if they have access to the answer to deciding do they want to give the answer etc cetera, etc cetera. so a question about time frame where you say in the last 12 months helps everybody answer the question the problem is is it loses a whole bunch of potential information like well what if it happened 13 months ago the problem with saying at any time in your academic career this survey is being designed for a very wide range of institutions with different populations, right? And so somebody who's a non-traditional student who may have started at age 18 or 19 and come back at age 35, thinks about that question very differently than the student who is in their second year and still 19 or 20 years old. So I, I just think that we have to, from a methodological point of view, I think you have to err on the side of writing a narrower question sort of like the 12 months or 24 months or something like that. Otherwise, you risk people answering. Otherwise, you risk people understanding the question very differently and yet still responding so that therefore that the answers you get don't actually mean what you think they mean necessarily. So that's my concern is that that's going to require. I think that this context is going to require that we write narrower, more specific time frame questions rather than open ended time frame. Yeah. What I was trying to indicate by since you started going to school was since you started going to Willamette University or since you, you know, since you you began taking classes at Portland Community College, um, but recognizing that there may be like those gaps, right? So like you said, somebody may have started taking classes at 18 and well, then come back at 35, but. But that's I I I you're I like that solution you've just proposed. That that basically makes sense as a good compromise between those two two ends of the concern that I had, right? Which is if you do frame it as in your in your current at any time in your current tenure at, right? Or something like that, has this happened to you? Then I think it that I think that is cognitively easy enough. It's you know, temporarily distinct, so you can draw sort of meaningful conclusions about it, things like that. So I, I, it can definitely be done. I like the one. I think that's what you've just suggested. There is a is a pretty clear way out of that potential conundrum for sure. I'm. I have a question um, regarding this conversation. So I'm thinking about a student who, who newly joined any of our institutions who experienced violence maybe especially if it's the beginning of their first term but they experience violence before coming but that violence is impacting their education how much is that valuable information to know like do we want to because this is what like depending on what we want to know do we want to know how this is how much of this is happening at our institution do we want to know how much these issues impact access to education like for us i think about how so many of the students we're serving they they are either actively experiencing domestic violence, they experienced it previously, but they are so excited to come back to school, but it's still impacting their education because of the trauma. So I, I appreciate the challenge with this this question because of our institutions being so, so different. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of like, who were, who's, what are we truly trying to capture to help us narrow that down? Because at PCC, so many of the students we served, the violence, I mean, they are actively experiencing violence, but we would miss out on so many students who returned to school after domestic violence took place. They are still impacted by that violence. And the school might be asked to, to provide supportive measures, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I guess I'm asking another question to help us clarify what we're trying to get to. Yeah. Yeah, Caroline, I absolutely agree with you. And I can tell you that the administrators, the Title IX coordinators are terrified because they're really afraid that people are going to see that they had 20 reports of sexual misconduct. OK, and they have 2000 students saying that they experienced sexual misconduct. And they they are afraid that that gap is going to be seen as something that they're not doing. Right. Or that they're going to get blamed for the sexual misconduct that's happening on their campus, even though it's not. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, and one way that we could get around that, of course, is to ask, at any point in your life, has anyone done these things to you? Has anyone done these things to you since you started going to this school, taking classes at the school? But that's twice as many questions, right? Yes, but we could also... 
you could ask that question, uh, has this ever happened to you? And then a very simple follow-up, which is, has this happened since you started at your current school? I mean, yes, it's more questions, but if you keep them simple and easy to answer and then and not cognitively stressful to process, the, the, then then length, you know, gets mitigated at least a little bit. And if those are two really meaningful data points, and I, it sort of feels like as an example, they would be, then I think it's you you strategically keep the ones that you care most about and then you pair away the ones that you think you don't need uh, and you can save time and space elsewhere. And I'll know if we ask that question, that's such good information for me to bring back to my, or for me to pull out for my institution to say, and this is why confidential advocacy matters. This is why that conversation of trauma-informed response matters, because this many of our students are saying that at some point in their life, even before coming here, they've experienced this violence. Therefore, if we want to set them up for success, we need to do these things. So it could be that, that could be really meaningful in my arguments about what programming we have at our institution. Ellen Adea? No comment about that. I, I think um, I agree with Kelly and I also agree with Carolyn. It's pretty good and helpful. I, I think I think it might not be very useful for us to live to us for us to ask whether this happened in your life before, given that it is something distributed to educational institutions. I don't I think it, it should better be focused on the context of higher education institutions. And honestly, I don't I don't know how much we should take care of like all the Title IX coordinators like worries about if the results showed way more student experiencing this on campus, but it didn't get enough reports. I, I think they should understand that they are and survivors have their own decisions about whether they want to put energy and effort into pursuing a case like this. And I I, I think I think since you start taking class at the school may make sense to me a lot. Yeah. I kind of see what Caroline is saying. So using my example, 2000 students say this happened to us. 200 say it happened to me since I started here and 20 reported. That gives you the scope that tells you the scope that there are, you know, there are 2000 students at the school who've had these experiences who will have been impacted by them even and need those resources right even though it didn't happen to them there right so like caroline's example you know someone who experienced domestic violence who is coming back to school to build skills so that they can support their family um that they may not need like no contact orders on campus or something like that but they may need more advocacy and they may need to um be able to access other campus resources or you know if they're having they they've got to go to court this semester that may be impacting their ability to to you know complete work or something like that so it even if it didn't happen on the campus it still has an impact on them but breaking it out the way that Kelly and, and Caroline were talking about I think helps the title IX coordinators feel less threatened by the question um, because they're like, oh, well, 2000, and, and actually it makes them look good, right? Because if Caroline, you can say, look, we've got 2000 people who trusted us enough to come here, um, who'd had that experience, uh, then they might see that as a positive. And then and it also helps that public education piece, right? If we can say, oh, this many people have had this experience, but only this many people have since they got here. I would just add, oh, squirrel. sorry. I think there's a squirrel. Sorry, I may have to do dog stuff in a minute. <laughs> uh, I was just going to add, um, I appreciate uh, your point, Bell. I would also say that, and, and we're not actually debating an actual question right here, but maybe it would be different if we had it written down, we were trying to make a decision. But sometimes um, you put questions in that you don't actually expect to analyze, but you put them in there to help the person get closer to the actual answer that you do want. So sometimes you'll build a series of questions. Like if you're, if it's a really complicated 
sort of thought process. You ask a question that they can answer, and then given your answer to that, what about this? What about this? This one isn't really that sophisticated, but I do think it helps people understand and think about their own lives and their experiences if 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 this two step question were to be included that way. Um, and that way, and I think it would actually help uh, to your point, Bell, that it would actually help students think solely about their experience on a campus if you draw that first distinction and say, okay, has this ever happened? Now, has it ever happened in your new location? Now you've sort of primed somebody to be thinking specifically about that. And this is esoterica that's beyond where our survey development is actually at right now, but I mean, but it is just part of like thinking about how and why you would do that. So. Thank you all for indulging me. I, I, I really, this, I do teach this stuff, so I just kind of get stuck sometimes. I think we all love this wonky stuff. I think, I mean, I, I know I'm speaking kind of broadly, but I, I feel like this, I, knowing knowing the people here, I think this is something that we're all like, like totally, except maybe Kevin, we're all enthralled by. <laughs> well, I, I invite you all to sort of tell me to just back off a little bit at any time if it gets a little too intense or is wasting our time. I can handle that too. I think that's I think that's why you're here, Kelly. Actually, just to add the wonkiness. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do then, if if it's okay, I mean, if someone has the time to to start drafting those, you know, to do a better job of drafting what that language in those questions is actually going to look like, that's fine. I'm happy to start that process, and then we can come back to it. And like I said, I want to recognize everyone's time. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left or 10 minutes left in this particular session. So I feel like, is there any in the other three documents that, so or, or I just wanted to point something out. All students are going to be answering all of the questions in A, B, C, D, and I, all the questions. And then all students are also going to be answering the questions in F, G, and H, or no, sorry. E Q L Q. Oh God. The, anyhow, there's a bunch of questions that all students are going to answer, and then there's some questions F G H and M N O P. Only survivors are going to be asked, right? And so that I just wanted to point that out. So um, the questions in E K L Q are asking about their perceptions of the campus environment. Um, I'm wondering if there's anyone who feels like I really feel strongly about looking at questions on reporting and disclosure, and I want to review those. Um, I'm happy to. I mean, I have to look okay. at whatever. I'm happy to look at all of them, but I can. Okay. So. But, um, yeah. If you'll yeah. remind me which A, B, C, D, whatever, what number, what letters those are, or what I should yeah. be looking at, that would be helpful. But I yeah. can prior. Um, if you could look at reporting and disclosure, I think Caroline, that would be really great because I think you have a certain, you have a lot of insight into that because it's asking about um, reporting on campus. So, would you feel comfortable looking at F, G, and H? And Bill, how? I'm sorry? I'll just note, I have looked at that already. Oh, I reviewed okay. all the documents part of the meeting except for the ABCD. I, at my first thing, I know I just had put some comments down because I had some initial questions for for conversation. So, um, but I'm happy to look at them again, especially if I need to think about a different lens to come to them at. Could you upload the document with your with your comments in it, or I did you do that already? I did. You it, did. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Good. Okay. I only gave that face because I was worried that it didn't work. Okay. Let me. I, I'm sorry. I'm going to look at my version of it. Um, okay. And yes. Yes. I do have your your. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and share that document right now. Hi, sweetheart. Hello, baby girl. She's doing really good, by the way. Um, there it is. Okay, this is Caroline's. Uh, this is F G and H with Caroline's edits, and oh, and Caroline, I'm I'm sorry, I've I've gotten really confused about because there's just so much. But I thought your 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 edits were great. Um, you broke out those two. I I thought they might treat me badly. I didn't want anyone to feel sorry for me. I think that makes a lot of sense. And then the other edit that you made was you um, added student staff or student leader. I think that's excellent. 
uh, to add that. And then made an anonymous report. I think that's really helpful to put that in. And then I think the other ones you had were this on-campus student conduct or Title IX office or an off-campus um, law enforcement officer. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so those are those are those are great. Okay. All right. So I was right. You do have special knowledge of that. Okay. Well, and I'm happy if there I'm happy to look at it again with there's another lens or a deeper lens. I realize that sometimes we look at them I'm like, yeah, I looked at it, but I wasn't as we have our conversations that opens up the opportunity to look at it in a new way. So if there's any thoughts around new ways to look at it, I'm happy to dive deeper into it. I'm actually wondering if someone else, since you've already done that deep dive, if somebody else wants to to take a pass through FGH and see if, if there's any changes they want to make in there. I can do it, FGH. Oh, great. Thank you, Adia. Okay. And then, um, Okay, so the other ones are the um, MNOP and the EL, EKLQ. And Kelly, I'm wondering if I could ask you to, to take a deep dive through the EKLQ, which is the Perceptions of Campus Environment. Do you, okay, great. Yes. Um, uh, let me make sure I write this down. Um, E K L Q. Yeah, it's one document, but yeah, and it's the perceptions of campus environment. Oh right, you have those. That's how you've labeled all those. Okay, so if I yes, yeah, I'll, yeah, yep, yeah. yep. I know it's so confusing. I am so sorry. And no, then no, it's not. It's it's not. I just I had forgotten that that's what they looked like. And no, yeah. that's fine. Okay. Um, and then Bell and Caroline, could I then ask you both to take a look at MNOP, which is the effects, the impacts on the survivors? Okay. I looked at it. Caroline has already done that. I can, you did. I can okay. see Caroline's comments there. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, great. All right, Caroline, you already did all your homework. <laughs> well, should I look at A, B, C, and D, and if there's any other letters, and add more, like try to start adding like example language, you know what I mean? Because I know we have a lot yeah. of um, like the job, the topic, but do should I start using descriptors? That'd be awesome. Okay. That'd be so good. If you have time for that, that would be so good. Oh my God, you guys, it's coming together. It's actually, it's so exciting. Thank you for okay, helping. I have, I have, everyone. Yes, no, I, 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 I second what Bell just said. It's good for me. I work well when I have something to work off of rather than being just generative on a blank page. So, yeah. um, and I just made sure that I have that file, Rowan, and I'm going to keep it open and write my homework and a little comment to myself. And so it will get done. Great. Okay, um, Caroline Bale had to go um, take care of her daughter and it's almost 2.30. Um, Kevin, can you let us know where we are in terms of having another meeting scheduled? Do we wanna just real quickly talk about, or I guess I wanna ask you all, we have, so next week's Thanksgiving. I, what is time anymore? I don't even understand it. And then um, the week after that, we have our full council meeting uh, on the on the fifth, and then after that, I think classes are going to probably be ending probably that following week or so, and it might be finals time. Um, are, how are people feeling about meeting again sometime in the next in the the week or two after Thanksgiving? I guess the bigger question is like, do you want to do one or two meetings in the month of December? Like how to how to space those out? I think for me, any time before December fifteen would probably be really hard because that's 
that the, these are the final weeks for me and I do need to defend my thesis around that time. So it might be hard. I'll try my best to leave comments for the um, part of the question Rowan just assigned to me, but there, I can't say that I'm sure I'm able to go to the meeting. I'll try, um, but it's likely due to my crazy schedule for those weeks that I won't be able to fit that in my schedule. Um, and I would say I'm willing to meet a couple of times for sure. That's not the question. Uh, I am unavailable after the 18th. Um, it, probably including the 18th, but if it were in the morning, I could probably participate. Uh, but prior to that, and I, I mean, the, this is just, I totally respect and understand Bell's got a completely different rhythm as a, as a student, soon to be graduating student, moving on student. Um, but I'm I'm happy to meet anytime after the after this weekend or after next weekend rather uh, the next the November break twice if we have to. I'm I'm available if you can just tell me the time. Uh, I'm not traveling for Thanksgiving and only thing only time I won't be available is the week of Christmas. Okay. Okay. So I guess. How does it sound that we we try for two meetings and and if you can't attend both of them that's fine but maybe the meeting the the week um of the sorry the cat, dog's eating something that she's not supposed to I'm just going to ignore it right now um but yeah Kevin can you send out the the when is good and then we'll try and do one between the 15th and the 17th so maybe <laughs> maybe try to yeah, find time yeah. in there and then maybe, so that sounds like the sweet spot for the second meeting then Maybe for the second meeting yeah and then the first meeting maybe the same week as um what is that the week of the first i guess try that okay yeah i'll send out a poll shortly and i also like i was like do you want to meet and kevin's like do you want to meet once or twice <laughs> <laughs> three times four mm. come on bye why, why sort yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else people need to talk about? Otherwise, it's time for us to leave the meeting and enjoy the rest of the sunlight before the sunset. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you all. Okay, bye. Thank you.